Welcome to the AUA Leadership and Business Podcast, where your logic professionals experience the practical application of business acumen essential to successfully navigating today's rapidly changing business environment. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to the AUA Leadership and Business Podcast episode for August 2022. I'm your host and moderator, Dr. Michael Darson. I'm a practicing urologist in Scottsdale, Arizona. I serve on multiple AUA committees. Today, we'll be discussing and examining various cases to provide an overview of the current state of medical malpractice in the U.S., how to manage and minimize your risk as a clinician, how to determine when you should seek legal counsel, and provide a descriptive understanding of malpractice litigation. Joining me today, I have Dr. David Albala. Dr. Albala completed his medical school training at Michigan State University and went on to complete his surgical residency at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Following this, he was endourology fellow at Washington University Medical Center. He practiced at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago and rose from the ranks of instructor to full professor in urology and radiology in eight years. After 10 years at Loyola, he became a tenured professor at Duke University Medical Center in North Carolina. At Duke, he was co-director of the Endourology Fellowship and director for the Center of Minimally Invasive and Robotic Urologic Surgery. He has over 220 publications in peer-reviewed journals and has authored three textbooks in endourology and six in general urology. He is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Robotic Surgery. Dr. Albala currently is chief of urology at Krauss Hospital in Syracuse, New York, and a physician at Associated Medical Professionals, a group of 29 urologists. He is considered a national and international authority on laparoscopic and robotic urological surgery and has been an active teacher in this area for over 20 years. He has served on the Large Urology Group Practice Association Board of Directors since 2016, and additionally currently serves on the AUA Leadership and Business Education Committee and State Advocacy Committee. Dr. Albala, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I think tonight's discussion is gonna be a very interesting one and one that's really relevant to, to all urologists, whether both in academic medicine or in uh, community practices. I totally agree. So let's get started. How common are medical malpractice cases in urology? And more importantly, will it happen to everyone? You know, Mike, it's, it's a really interesting question. And, you know, when you look at statistics, it's, it's hard to draw generalized conclusions. But, you know, it's estimated that the average urologist will have two malpractice cases during their entire career in the United States. So you think that the average urologist practices for 30 to 40 years each of us will develop, you know, probably two cases that will occur um, over over our practice period. And, you know, it's it's interesting because I think that these cases can be really devastating to, to urologists. When when the papers arrive and you're sued for the first time, you, you, you get a sense of inadequacy that you've done something wrong, even though, you know, in many of the cases, you really haven't done anything wrong. And, you know... If you look at the Westlaw database, which is a database looking at, you know, malpractice cases around the United States, the most commonly uh, named defendants have been primary care physicians. And that happens, you know, about 74% of the time. And next is urologists at about 19% of the time. So clearly, 20% of our profession will get sued. And it's, it's much more common than we think. And I think you need to be prepared. There are things that you can do to try to uh, reduce your risk. But, you know, not every case that has a, a not a perfect ending is malpractice. And that's the real differentiator. And there are things that you can do to prevent malpractice cases from happening. Okay, let's get a little bit more technical. What constitutes medical malpractice? Well, you really have to have four components for medical malpractice to occur. You know, first is the duty uh, of the care of the physician. There has to be a breach in the duty. There has to be a direct or proximate injury that results 
from that breach, and then there's damage to the patient. And you have to have all of these elements, you know, and a jury has to, to find all of these elements, uh, you know, to find a physician guilty of malpractice. So, you know, a bad outcome doesn't necessarily mean malpractice has occurred. For example, if you do a TUR and you've explained the surgical procedure to a patient, you know that the risks of surgery are infection, bleeding, erectile dysfunction, incontinence, and retrograde ejaculation. Those are the common risks that occur. You know, could death occur? Yes, but it's, it's a very, very low probability. If you do a TUR and a patient develops a urinary tract infection after the surgical procedure, that's not malpractice if you follow the guidelines to give appropriate antibiotics afterwards. And, and I think that this is where the AUA has done a really nice job is, you know, when you look at the educational resources that the AUA provides with guidelines, those guidelines really help direct the care. And then if you're sued, those guidelines, we can rely on them. You don't have to follow the guidelines precisely, but as closely as you can will make the case much, much easier to, to try to defend. And, and, you know, I've used guidelines. I've defended physicians, you know, malpractice cases around the country. And one of the first things I do is I look at the guidelines to try to establish what the standard of care is. And once you try to follow that standard of care, um, the, the chance of, uh, of, of a successful verdict in a, in a jury trial really increases rather dramatically. When you refer to the duty of the care of the physician, is that the standard of care that you're referring to as a duty of the physician? Yes, yes. In other words, you know, when you take care of a physician, when you take care of a patient, if you order a laboratory test, it's even though you may be in a large group and you delegate someone to look at that culture, the responsibility does fall back on you. If if the patient has a urinary tract infection and it goes untreated or it gets lost in the shuffle of papers on your desk, you are ultimately responsible, you know, for following through on, on laboratory tests that you order um, and, and things like that. So that's the standard of care. And the standard of care may differ from guidelines. In other words, if you do a, a cryoablation in a procedure, a uh, procedure on a patient, you have a small renal mass, the patient's elderly, you decide you want to, you know, either uh, microwave the lesion or um, uh, cryoablate it. You know, the guidelines suggest that at three months, you should get a, a CT scan with and without contrast. And then at a year, you should repeat the CT scan as well as a chest x-ray. Now, if you do it 13 months later instead of 12 months, you know, that's I would tell you would be an acceptable standard of care. But if you don't do that, you know, a CT, you know, for four years afterwards, and then there's a metastatic lesion that appears in the, the chest, that's probably outside the standard of care. And so the guidelines can give you direction. They're not, you don't have to follow them to the T, but I think what's important is to understand the concepts and, and, you know, the guideline committees work very hard to put these guidelines together. They're based on, on the literature and scientific evidence. You know, and our job as physicians is to try to follow those guidelines because that's what the standard of care has been established in the urological community. Well, Dr. Albella, I think that's a, a very, very important point um, that I want to hone in a little bit more. You know, when you first get out of residency, Obviously, you, you know what the standard of care because it's been drilled into you for the, all the years of your training. But as you get older and obviously lifelong training and lifelong learning tries to make sure that people keep up, I think it's important for like I'm 57 and I refer to guidelines to make sure that I know what you know the current standard of care is. And it's good to have you know a resource that you can actually go to that's easily accessible, provided by the AUA. Um, to make sure that you're you're following, you know, current recommendations and current standards to keep you out of trouble. Yeah, and that's really true. And I think the American Board of Urology has really pivoted nicely to this lifelong learning. I mean, they have very good evidence to suggest that, you know, looking at guidelines in the way now that, you know, we used to take a, a you know, a test every 10 years. 
now they're they're making us do something every year. Whether you take a, a, a you know a, an at home test, you know where you can look things up, um, and then the next year you read articles and guidelines to try to keep abreast of things. I think the AOA and the American Board of Urology has done a really nice job to try to make us, you know, keep up to date because clearly, you know, when when the a a American Board of Urology grandfathered people in, I think those people that were grandfathered in did not continue with their educational process. And there's good data to suggest that that this process really is much, much better. Okay. So we've we've we now understand kind of what constitutes medical malpractice. What are the most common causes of urologic malpractice? Well, we can have a lot of different causes of malpractice in, in urology. Obviously, misdiagnosis or the failure to diagnose, you know, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, prostate cancer. You know, there's failure to perform a diagnostic test when certain symptoms are present. You know, urological surgery mistakes, you know, can occur you know, from cystoscopy all the way to, you know, circumcision. Um, uh, you can have anesthetic complications and errors, medication errors. All of these potentially could constitute malpractice. And it's interesting, you know, in one study, the most commonly performed procedures that have been brought to malpractice litigation are circumcisions and vasectomies. And in the United States, those procedures, which we would probably consider really basic procedures with, you know, have the greatest risk associated with them. Um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, we also see, you know, claims that have taken place from, you know, surgical performance and outcomes. Misdiagnoses in urology represent about 15% of overall malpractice cases that we see. So the misdiagnosis of prostate cancer at least in prostate cancer, this is one of the things that is is really relevant for for primary care physicians. You know, I've defended a number of primary care physicians on on prostate cancer diagnosis and PSA testing. And since the United States Preventative Task Force has muddied the waters about PSA testing, that's been a uh, you know uh, an area that that in you know when when that change occurred in in primary care physicians stopped doing PSA testing, um, that, that we saw a, a really jump in there, a spike in the number of malpractice cases associated with prostate cancer. But the bottom line is, is you know, it can revolve from when the patient walks in the office to doing the surgical procedure or the post-operative care. And I think that, that the, the, the takeaway message is, you know, you have to be on your game and, you know, you have to do things that are reasonable. And, and you know, if you're conscientious and, and you have policies in place, for example, of when laboratory values come in, that you don't miss them, you know, that's going to minimize your risk. And, indeed, I think that that's really in, important. And, you know, so the bottom line is the, the responsibility really falls on the physician. And as physicians, we need to be on top of this and, and, and be aware of that there are areas where we could get in trouble all along the way. So, uh, you know, I think most urologists are familiar with vasectomy as one of the highest malpractice cases. Um, why are circumcision? I mean, is it primarily a cosmetic outcome that they're unhappy with, or is there something else that we should be thinking about counseling our patients about? Well, the biggest cause of, uh, for circumcisions is that too much skin is taken off and patients have, you know, can get a buried penis, you know, they can co complain about erectile dysfunction and so on and so forth. So it is a cosmetic thing, you know. I tell you, I, I, I think back to my own career and the first case that I ever did after I graduated from residency and my fellowship was a circumcision. And it, it's one thing to have an attending in the, in the operating room with you and, you know, you're doing the case and it's very you know, casual, but when you do your first case alone, I, I remember that case so vividly, you know, sweat was pouring down my back and it's, it's only a circumcision. I mean, it's not, you know, a, a cable thrombus with a kid, big kidney tumor. I mean, it's a circumcision, but I think you have to be careful that, you know, you want to do the best job 
And, you know, it's always better to err on the side of being conservative. And um, I know of a malpractice case right now on a, on a, a patient, um, a physician that had a patient that, that did a circumcision and is getting sued for it. So it happens. I'm aware of those cases and, and know about those cases, you know, and they happen in the community. So uh, vasectomies, obviously, you know, with vasectomies, it's, you know, performing the vasectomy, but also informing the patient that they have to test to make sure that the vasectomy was successful. And there's a lot of litigation that patients, you know, have unprotected intercourse and, you know, and then they get a, a, a child and, and that's the, the major reason for vasectomies. You know, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that you brought up those points about circumcision. Every time I do one still today, I tell myself, don't take too much every single time. So good, uh, good words of wisdom. So let's talk about um, malpractice and documentation. Um, can you speak about that? Sure. And, and, you know, documentation is everything. You know, bad records make for a bad defense. And I can tell you that if the documentation is really critical, if there are no records, then there's no defense. Because, you know, the medical mal record was, is, is created by the practitioner. It's a legal document. And in the court of law, the physician, through documentation, tells his story. And so, um, you know, as, as in the cases that I've represented physicians, if it's not document, documented, then whatever was done was not done. In other words, if a rectal examination is not documented in the medical record, then it's not done. And that's why even if a patient declines to have a rectal examination, when I see a patient today in my office and they say, you know, doc, I don't want to have a rectal today, I don't just leave it deferred. I, I put in my note, the patient declined a rectal examination, you know, at today's visit. And he's entitled to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But if the patient comes back and develops metastatic prostate cancer and you haven't done the documentation of a rectal examination, then you have fallen below the standard of care. And I know of one case in which a physician was sued because he did not do a rectal exam in a patient. Now, you know, the rectal exam, one can debate how, how accurate it is in picking up prostate cancer. You know, I think we all would agree that with PSA testing and a rectal exam, that's the best way that we have, you know, in 2022. But if you don't document it, it wasn't done. And, and it really makes it much, much harder for the defense team to kind of say, well, I did it, or I do it all the time, but I just forgot to put it in my note. And clearly, documentation can save a, phys a physician in a malpractice case. So the documentation is extremely, extremely important. You can't overemphasize how important it is. So you mentioned that you've done a, a lot of defense. So on behalf of practicing urologists everywhere, we really appreciate all the work and uh, time that you've done to defend uh, doctors across the country. Um, I think you probably have a very unique perspective on how the electronic medical record has has impacted, you know, documentation and uh, and malpractice cases. Can you speak to to that? Sure. The, you know, the EMR can be a good thing and a bad thing. You know, there's a lot of documentation in, in cases that I've done in which the EMR, you know, says one thing, but the physician says, well, you know, that's just auto-populated and, and, you know, I didn't really do that. So it can be a nemesis for you. That's why, you know, every medical record that I dictate and, and you know, click and, and, and put pieces of information in the record, you know, you want to be as accurate as you can. And, and the things that you do are extremely important to be very accurate in that record because that's the legal document. And that's the thing that's going to get you in and out of trouble, quite honestly. You know, there's so many different medical records out there. You know, each one is different. Um, you know, we all have really pivoted from, you know, I remember the days when I was a resident and I'd be in the clinic writing these notes. You know, now I think we can be much more comprehensive, but there's a lot of extra information that maybe is irrelevant. And so, 
you just have to pay attention to the EMR. The EMR can be your friend, but it also can, can hurt you too in these cases. And, and I will tell you that, you know, every chart is extremely important. And when you're doing the documentation and the dictation after your visit, you know, you want to be as precise as you can on the things that you did and the things that you, you didn't do. And you need to make sure you check that and, and be very careful about that. How would you counsel uh, clinicians about when to sign off on their notes? So, you know, that, that's a great question. You know, we have a rule in our practice that the dictations have to be done, you know, within 24 hours and they have to be signed off, you know, within, within three days. Um, that's a rule that we put in our practice. You know, I served as the medical director for our group and we had a, a physician that wouldn't comply with that, you know, and his argument was, you know, I'm really busy. I'm seeing a big clinic and I'm tired, you know, and, and, you know, the, the, the dictations and the notes wouldn't be done for, you know, four to six weeks later. And there's no way that you can be precise if you're putting together a note four weeks after a visit, even if you take the best of notes, those notes are not going to be the same type of caliber. And so, you know, in our practice, we made this rule and we still had a physician that was an outlier and he just never complied. And we, 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 we said, listen, we, you need to cut down your clinics. You put gaps in your visits to allow you to do the dictations I try not to see more than three patients before I dictate a note because I can't remember what I did on, on more than three patients. So I, I just have a rule that I just go into my office and I just, you know, now today some people have scribes, which can help with that. There are ways to mitigate, you know, trying that. But, but the bottom line is, is, you know, he still persisted in this behavior and we ended up finding him. And, you know, money all of a sudden changes behaviors in physicians. So when you take $1,000, you know, from a physician, you know, we charge $25 a day per note. So if you have two clinics or three clinics and you haven't done them for a month, that's a significant amount of money. And that's, that totally changed your behavior. And now it's not a problem in our practice at all. So, um, you know, we try to keep them on top of that. You know, we try to follow what hospitals do. You know, it's good practice to dictate your operative note right after you do the surgery. I can tell you I've defended some physicians where the op note was dictated, you know, three weeks, four weeks afterwards. And those cases become much harder to try to defend. So those are all simple things that I think you can take away do to, to really reduce your risk at, at being sued. How would you counsel um, a clinician about this? So I, I've heard of cases where um, the provider didn't sign off on their notes um, in a timely fashion. And then before signing off, went back and changed the note and then signed off. It's my understanding that metadata can trace that. And so that's a problem uh, for a defense team if that happens. Is that, is that accurate? That is 100% accurate. If you have dictated a note and signed it, and, you know, I've never defended a physician that went back and changed the notes. I know that there are cases out there. Um, that is a huge red flag. And today, with the electronic medical record, you can see exactly what date, what time, where the changes occurred. So, um, you know, say you, you did something that, you know, maybe it was not the standard of care and all of a sudden you get sued and you're going back to try to cover your tracks. That is a, that's the biggest no, no, you know, from, from, you know, advice in, in malpractice litigation. The first thing you do as a clinician is never change the medical record. It only will get, it will only get you in more trouble, you know, because then the jury doesn't look as you as a credible physician. You're changing things to make the story look better for you rather than you can say, well, you know, um, you know, this is what happened and this is why I did this procedure, you know, and, and I got into some bleeding and I, I called the general surgeon in 
you know, you don't need to say that, oh, there really wasn't that much bleeding. I mean, you know, the one thing I've learned in, in 33 years of practice is, you know, you have to be honest with patients. And the first thing is, is not everybody gets a perfect outcome. You know, if a, a stone doesn't break up and it gets pushed up into the kidney, don't say, oh, I cleared the stone out and, you know, we can, we can take the stent out and, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, be honest with the patient and say, listen, I broke the stone up. Some of the stone I was able to get out, but a piece of it went up into the kidney. And, you know, I think we need to make sure we treat that before we, we pull your stent. And maybe we should shockwave it or whatever procedure is. But honesty is the first policy, and it's the only policy. And if you're not honest, you know, then I think you need to look at yourself in this profession because, you know, 99.9% .9 of urologists are honest. And there's, you know, there are some dishonest urologists. I, I, you know, every profession has it. But I want to think that we do what we do. One, we try to do the best, you know, thing possible. I don't think that any urologist has malintent of injuring the person. So, you know, you have to look at the bigger picture. But, you know, malpractice does occur. And I've read cases in which I don't believe, you know, those cases are, are defensible. And, you know, I, I will tell a plaintiff attorney, you know, I can't, I can't defend this case. And you need to be honest with, with you, you know, yourself. And honesty is the best policy. Wise words, for sure. So let's, uh, let's change gears a, a little bit. What are some of the top risks of a physician's office practice? So, you know, an office is sort of a unique environment or a clinic, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. You're seeing a number of patients. They're being, you know, when you see a, a clinic of 20, 30, 40 patients, there's a lot happening. Clearly, documentation in the medical record is extremely important. You want to make sure that your documentation is done precisely. Like I said, I like to document after seeing two or three patients, you know, and just trying to make sure and adjust my day and my schedule that allows me to do that. You know, when you get a telephone call, that kind of documentation is extremely important. You know, if a patient calls in and says, you know, I just had shockwave lithotripsy, I have a fever, um, you know, um, I'm vomiting, I'm nauseated, you know, and you say, listen, you need to go to the emergency room, and the patient says, no, I'm going to stay at home, if you don't document that, potentially you're liable for that. So telephone documentation, that's just one example, I think, you know, covering physician documentation is extremely important. I'm, I'm actually defending... Uh, a general surgeon in a case right now in, in New York who did a laparoscopic hernia repair. And the patient, um, you know, had a trace of blood in their urine at the end of the procedure. They didn't do anything about it. The patient went into the recovery room, developed urinary retention, and the physician wrote, discharge the patient after voiding. Five o'clock came, he goes off, the covering physician comes in and he says, listen, it's okay to discharge the patient, but, you know, and, and so the nurse follows that, the, the, the covering urologist, you know, discharges the patient, the patient goes into urinary retention, and the next day comes in with a perforated bladder. And so the question is, is if you're a covering physician, you know, sign out is extremely important. We, you know, sign out every, every morning or every night you know, to the covering physician to make sure that they understand what's going on with the physicians, with the patients that they're covering. There's obviously, you know, in the office, confidentiality is extremely important. That's, you know, HIPAA and HIPAA violations. You may say, how can a HIPAA violation occur in 2022? But they do. Um, and then, you know, we get patient consents for office procedures, surgical procedures, even some laboratory tests. You know, when we order a, an oncotype or a, a decipher for a prostate cancer patient, you know, we have a, a consent form that says we are, we're sending this tissue out to a company because we want to make sure we're covered and we have documentation. So there are many, many landmines that exist in the office. And I think just being conscientious, getting a routine down, 
that's the best advice I can give you. If you were um, coming out of practice or coming out of residency and joined a practice and you felt like that practice maybe didn't have enough policies and procedures in place, you know, based on your training and stuff like that, where, where would someone seek out a place to, to see policies and procedures like this? Well, you know, there, there are a number of resources. Obviously, you know, many practices have policies and procedures. You know, I'm part of uh, LUGPA and uh, on the Board of Trustees for, for you know, the Large Urology Group Practice Association. And, you know, if, a, if someone called me up and said, do you have a policy on, on consent forms for, you know, prostate cancer biomarkers? I would say, yes, I have it. I'll send you a copy how we incorporate it in our medical record, and here's the flow. So, you know, I think reaching out to colleagues is one way. You know, LUDPA does a nice job with that. The AUA has valuable resources, you know, and, and I think most urologists are happy to share this kind of information with one another. You know, what happens in Arizona or Texas, you know, is, is going to be slightly different than what happens in upstate New York. But, you know, the bottom line is, is, you know, the more policies and procedures that you have, once you get them, though, you have to follow them. And so if you incorporate them, it's, it's really not a good scenario to have policies and procedures, but don't follow them. That puts you, again, at risk for, for litigation. So, um, but, you know, I think when I came, when I first came up to Syracuse, you know, I came from an academic environment, you know, both at Loyola and Duke, and, you know, we had certain policies, and, and then, you know, we started to adapt things that we did in academic practice in the, our private practice, and, you know, for example, like rectal swabs, so every patient that gets a prostate biopsy gets a rectal swab, and, you know, that reduced our infection risk from 3% down to 0.6%, so that doesn't seem like a lot, but let me just tell you, you know, patients are dying of urosepsis, you know, from prostate biopsy. I, I, you know, I got a call from a, a plaintiff attorney asking me to read a case um, on, a, on a prostate biopsy infection in which the, the individual developed septic emboli and lost fingers. You know, I read the case and the urologist did everything right. And I told the plaintiff attorney, I said, if you take this case, you're going to lose. And, you know, he said, oh, I'm not going to take the case. Now, it, it just so happened it was the same plaintiff attorney that I did a malpractice case in for a stone case in which he thought, you know, um, he, he was going to win and we won that case, you know, the stone case. So, but, you know, most urologists do follow the guidelines. I think there are very few that deviate from the guidelines. And, you know, the AUA has done a really great job with those. Those, if, if you had to tell me what, what, one of the greatest things the AUA does for its members, it's the guidelines. Those educational guidelines really tell us how to practice and they keep us out of trouble as well. Great points. Uh, are there any urology case observations or specific cases that you'd like to go over? You know, I, I tell you, I, I, for those of you that are gonna do this work in the future, you know, it, it's kind of like studying for the boards for me. You know, it's, it's, it's a puzzle. You know, I, I clear my kitchen table, I put the records on, I go through the records. You know, you want to be a, a weenie about looking at everything. And I, I did a malpractice case in, in Kansas City a, a number of years ago when I was at Duke. And there was an individual that had a uric acid stone. And it was a big uric acid stone. It was like a four or five centimeter stone. You know, clearly, you know, alkaline therapy, you know, would have dissolved part of it, but it, it's such a big stone, it wasn't going to dissolve very well. He tried it, didn't really change in size. Um, but the patient actually, he didn't really do significant alkaline therapy because the patient had a heart disease and you can't give potassium citrate due to his heart condition. So, so he did a perk on this individual. He had a complication and the, the patient actually passed away. So you look at the surface, you say, you've got a uric acid stone, you know, the patient does, a, the surgeon does a, pay, a procedure on the patient and the patient dies. 
And so a plaintiff attorney said, geez, you know, this is a no brainer. I'm going to sue the urologist. So when you look at the records, you know, I went through the records and, you know, they had a stone analysis and a piece of fragment that was removed was 100% uric acid. And the plaintiff expert, you know, was all ready to jump on how he should have dissolved the stone and it's a uric acid stone and this is treated with dissolution therapy. The bottom line is, is, you know, he looked at, he looked at the, you know, stone uh, uh, analysis. I actually got the x-rays up and the x-rays showed that you could see an outline of the stone. So it was a mixed uric acid calcium stone. So when the jury, you know, when I get on the stand, he says, Dr. Albala, what's the, the analysis of this, this stone? And I said, well, clearly it's a mixed uric acid calcium stone. And so he thinks he's got me pinned into a corner. So he puts the, the, the stone analysis report and he said, doctor, read this for the jury. It says 100% uric acid. So do you disagree? And I said, yes, I disagree with that report. And he goes, well, show me why in the record where you disagree. So I said, here, I had all three x-rays. I put a, a, a picture of a calcium oxalate stone up. You can see the stone. I put a picture of a uric acid stone up. You can't see the stone. And then I put a picture of a mixed stone. And I'll never forget it. The jury, you know, is in the jury box. You know, you got the railing in front. All the people are looking at this little view box in Missouri. And I say, here is the stone. And I get a a sharpie and outline the stone and i said this is the stone the report says uric acid it can't be 100 percent uric acid and that was the lawyer and of course we won the the case you know for the the it was a, a verdict in in the in in favor of the defendant and the lawyer three years later called me up about this septic case and and i reviewed it for him i didn't charge him anything and and i said if you take this case you're going to lose this case so, you know, attention to detail is extremely, extremely important. And, you know, I've been successful at this. It's, it's really kind of, you know, you're almost like a detective trying to find out the nooks and the crannies and understanding everything. But, you know, what I try to do is put myself in that position of the urologist. Was it reasonable what he did? You know, how he repaired this? Or did he do this flap on a urethroplasty? Was that, you know, positive or you know, whatever the procedure or, or test, you know, and I put myself in that place. And if I, if I think it's reasonable, you know, then I'll read the case and say, I think we can defend this. And in a similar fashion, if, if I think there's such a deviation, then I say we can't defend it. And, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. Yeah, I must say uh, that, that stone case was really cool to hear about. Um, there must be a, a great amount of gratification when you're up in that checkmate position and you can see the jury's faces change and you know you've done a really great service for one of your colleagues. So that's, well, that's, that's the Perry Mason moment. You, know, I, you don't get many Perry Mason moments in urology, but for me, I'll never forget that case. And let me tell you, I see that urologist at the AOA meetings. He comes up to me and he... Every, he's so grateful and, and you know, um, and you know what? I didn't do anything that wasn't appropriate. I just, I just called it like it was. And, and you know, and, and, and that's the, the, the greatest satisfaction. You know, having been on both sides of the aisle, I mean, I've been sued, you know, in one of my cases. You know, I help urologists defend cases. You know, and, and, and in the same manner, I also read cases and, and, you know, for the plaintiff, too. And, but, you know, uh, I can tell you there are a lot of cases that are brought to the attention, you know, of courts that don't really warrant, you know, that designation of a malpractice case. And, you know, it does change how you practice a little bit. So, um, you know, after 33 years, I'm a little wiser. You know, maybe I have a few less hairs on the top of my head and some gray hairs. But, uh, you know... The one thing about urology, it's, it's a great profession. I, I am so grateful to be a urologist and practicing, and I'm grateful to the colleagues that I, I, I have in, around the country. And, you know, the AUA has done a great job in, in helping us try to, you know, get out of cases that, that by developing guidelines that prevent us from getting into to problem cases. 
Well, Doc, Dr. Albala, this has been extremely uh, informative, very educational. Um, thank you from not only myself, but all the listeners. Um, this has been invaluable for all of us. Thank you very much. Happy to do it, and, and thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make AUA Leadership and Business your go-to podcast. Subscribe today by searching AUA Leadership and Business on your favorite podcast app and enhance your leadership and business education needs.